Good morning. Um, I am here to help you learn and to help you answer any questions, and I'll tell you if I don't know. So don't be afraid to ask questions throughout the talk, and I mean, don't be afraid to speak up if you do have questions. So a little bit about me. I've been with Grain Millers for over six years now. I, when I started, I procured flax, mustard, and lentils, and those are the most awful grains to ever have to procure, I think. So I am so glad that I now get to work with small grains. Um, I mainly buy for our mill in St. Ansgar, Iowa, which is only about 40 miles from here. So I buy oats, hard red wheat, soft white wheat, barley, triticale, and rye. And I buy both organic and conventional. So do we have, I know we have some organic questions, but are there any organic growers here? So we do have some, and then I'm assuming the rest are conventional. So I will talk about both markets today. Um, I also run our sustainable grower program, and I also help a little bit. We do a lot of research on oat production, and I get to work from home in Pipestone, Minnesota, which is really nice. And then these are my two kids, so you always have to start with a picture of your kids to soften up the crowd a little bit. So our daughter Neva and our son Drake. Okay, so grain millers. The main thing we do is mill oats. That is what we do. We have three oat mills across Canada and the US. We also have a corn mill in Indiana. I won't talk about that. You're just a little bit too far to be into that marketplace here. But I will talk about a lot what we do at St. Ansgar, because that's the market you'll be able to work into. So we, just basics, we bought it in 1986. 152 employees work there. We do oats, barley, hard red wheat, soft white wheat, rye, and triticale there, both organic and conventional. Have any of you ever sold to us before? Okay, so a good amount with it. And your grain most likely went to that location, I'm guessing. Okay, so we'll talk just a little bit about the marketplace, just kind of a big picture of it. So, and Sarah kind of already enlightened us on this, we see a lot of growth in bars. People are on the go, so like granola bars, um, some of our popular customers would be like cliff bars, different things like that. We see a lot of growth in bars. We see continued decline in cold cereal sales. People are eating less and less cereal. I actually read an article this summer, and millennials don't like cereal, do you know why? It's too much work, yep. <laughs> that is exactly what it, and I can say that, I'm in the millennial technically, so I can make fun of my generation. But you get out the bowl, you gotta get the cereal, you have a dirty dish, they don't like that. They want it to be on the go. And so all these customers, all these Kellogg's post Jenner Mills, they're really hurting on cereal sales. I think the only brand of cereal that is grown is Honey Nut Cheerios and Cheerios. Those are the only two that are showing growth. So this is our company information, okay? So we do show stagnant growth in conventional oat products. We only see a 1% growth each year. That's just normal oats that you buy, something in instant oatmeal package. That is a pretty stagnant growth. However, we do see strong growth in organics. Our company, we see 12% growth year over year. And we do anticipate that to be the norm for the next five. Strong growth in gluten-free. Oats are naturally gluten-free, so we've seen a 20% growth in demand for that. We've also seen a strong growth in quick service restaurants. Starbucks, McDonald's, Dairy Queen in the South, of all places, serves oatmeal, um, Jamba Juice, that is like the new thing, is kind of these culinary oatmeals. So we do see a lot of growth in that. Actually had oatmeal from McDonald's today on the way here. Um, stagnant growth in the giant food companies, it's not the thing to the consumer. And keep in mind, who is one of the largest buyers now in the marketplace as a consumer? The millennial generation. And it's the first generation that is willing to pay more for their food. So they drive a lot of change. We see a lot of growth in new brands that didn't exist five years ago, 
social media has completely changed that. I mean, companies can start up and they can be big and being bought out by General Mills in three, year, three years. So we do see a lot of growth in that. So we do see that our growth requires about new milling capacity every two to three years. And we do anticipate our business is gonna double in the next 10 years. So the biggest thing is we do need to continue to partner with growers like you to meet this growth. Because it's not going away, it's gonna continue. So we'll talk a little bit just about the organic market. Demand for organic food is hitting record levels. So we showed a 12% growth, but they anticipate it'll be a 16% growth annually from 2015 to 2020. So when they do all these different polls, 57% of people say they would prefer organic if given a choice. 84% of Americans purchase it organic and 60% weekly. I mean, even in my small town of Pipestone, Minnesota, if I wanted to feed my family 100% organic, I could do that. And it's 3,000 people. But we have the option in the grocery store, and if they don't have it, Amazon.com will bring it in two days. So that is driving just the availability. So fruit and vegetables make up a majority of the growth. So why is this growth occurring? What's kind of some of your feedback? Why do you think organic demand is so big? Perception of health, millennials. What else? Yeah, economy with it. Health concerns, and I'm not saying these are legit health concerns, it's just what people have. Chemicals, glyphosate, GMOs, increased awareness, improved standard of living, government initiatives. The Obama administration, no matter what you think politically, it was the first administration friendly to the organic farmer that they've ever had. And just organic availability. Like I said, I live in a town of 3,000 people, and I could feed my family organic if I wanted to. I mean, it's just available. OK, so this is looking at the conventional oat market, OK? So kind of switching gears. Canada supplies U.S. oatmeals with about 90% of their oats. That's a lot. So 90% of the oats that any U.S. oatmeal mills comes from Canada. So this year, Canada will have near record low carryout stocks. And they're getting a lot of rain. If you pay attention in the news, we're very concerned about the quality. The first stuff that got harvested looked really good this year but we're a little bit concerned about some of the stuff that got harvested later. We do anticipate that a lot of it won't be able to go to the milling market anymore. So the funds, the lovely funds, and how they work with our markets, they have shorted the oat market for two years. Okay, so that means they have a net short position on the market, so that drives the market down. So, but just this week, they actually went long. This is the first time they went long on the oat market for over two years, okay? That just happened, I think it was Tuesday. I, I don't know if I put it up there. So, the problem with the oat futures market is it really is irrelevant anymore. Even the grades at the oat futures market, the standards they have, is not what the milling industry has. Do you know what the test weight is for oats? The U.S. grade? 32. Do you know what the minimum is that we buy? 38. It's not even close. And that's just one example, spec-wise, on what the industry is demanding. And then there's just not a lot of buyers in the oat futures market. And if you don't have enough people in it, it just doesn't make sense anymore. So it would not surprise me in the next 10 years if we don't trade oats on, on futures anymore. Um, that's where I put just on Tuesday, they went long. So we do have record basis levels being paid out. I mean, there were times I was paying a dollar over the futures market. So always call to get the price. I talked to so many farmers and they're like, the price is so low on the board. That's the board. You gotta figure out what your basis is. So always call to find out what the price is. Don't just look at the Chicago Board of Trade. 
to get your information. So there's actually more flat price trading going on than basis, so that means it's just a flat price. It's not a basis added onto the board, and I'll go through that a little bit later. So, I mean, we have lots of questions. Will the funds stay long? Will they go short? All that stuff, but that is kind of what is affecting your oat future or your oat future prices. Also, who sells the U.S. a lot of oats? Which country? Canada. What is Canada's biggest driver for their economy? Oil. What have oil pri prices done? They've gone down. So what's the Canadian exchange rate done? Gone down. I can buy wheat for $6 in Canada, and I can buy wheat for $5 in the US, and it'll land at the same price in Iowa. That is what your exchange rate does. That is huge. So that is also why sometimes we haven't seen oat prices come up, because it really does follow the oil market just because Canada is the largest exporter. So, okay, so why don't millers use domestic oats besides that there haven't been that many? Why else don't they like them? Not consistent enough. Not consistent, quality and um, quantity. A lot of it's been lack of storage and just problems with varieties. And it kind of was talked about too up earlier that there wasn't a lot of emphasis on oat breeding programs. And we're finally seeing that change here in the US. But forever, we only had one and a half full-time oat breeders in the US. That's not very many to be pumping out new varieties every year. So we're seeing a resurgence. We're seeing a lot of new varieties come out that help with our quality and to be more consistent. And also, we're seeing infrastructure where we can start to buy oats and store them down here instead of buying them out of Canada as much. So we see our opportunity. We have a lot more storage. If any of you have been around St. Ansgar lately, we, you'll see a lot of construction going on. We put up, is it two, two million bushels of capacity that we're actually just gonna start getting those bins filled up this week and emptying them out. So that'll be ready to go in February. So we'll have two million bushels worth of storage capacity extra. Um, we'll have another dumping pit. If you've ever delivered, it takes forever. So we're going to have another dumping pit. We have interest in new varieties. Glyphosate free. I, it is a practice sometimes to desiccate your crops, small grains, before you harvest. That, if you're going to sell to us or to a lot of food grade companies, that will not be allowed. It has shown that it won't mill. Like if an oat comes through our mill that we know has been sprayed, or like we've done studies that's been sprayed with glyphosate, when it gets to the mill, it shatters. It's just like getting an early frost. It hasn't completely formed. Another thing is consumers, you read these things, they pull Quaker oats or any kind of oats off the shelf, they test them for glyphosate, and it's over the levels it should be. They're starting to see that glyphosate does increase if you desiccate it before harvest. So that is a practice that is not going to be accepted long term. And I, it's not as common down here in Canada, it's very common to do that, but that is something that is going to be very, you'll see that coming more and more. OTA free, that's just a, it's a toxin in storage. Um, and U.S. oats don't tend to have a problem with it as much as other countries, just because our oats tend to be a little bit drier. And like everybody, we want a shorter distance. I mean, they showed the map with barley, how their barley sourcing is moving west and north. It's the same thing with oats. You show a map five years ago where we procured oats, it's all in Alberta, Canada now instead of Saskatchewan practically. And I know maybe not everyone's familiar with what Canada, but Alberta would be like above Idaho where we used to buy more above Montana, just keeps moving farther west. And the bad thing with that is because those oats have less beta-glucan. So when you see the heart-healthy claim on cereal boxes, that's the beta-glucan in oats. And the farther north and west you go, the less beta-glucan there is in oats. 
So that's an advantage you have as a U.S. farmer, Minnesota, Iowa, you have high beta-glucan in your oats. And we're doing more domestic oatmeal runs too. Okay, so this is from the 2015 crop year. We compared the average for the whole year. So our fiscal year runs from October 1st to the end of September. We compared the average test weight from Canadian conventional, U.S. conventional, Canadian organic, and U.S. organic. This really shocked me when we first saw it. I mean, does it anybody else? It did not used to be like that. This number was always in the 30s, the US one, usually right around 38, 39. So this is huge. We're starting to show that these newer varieties, we have two full-time mode agronomists, Albert Lee Seed does a lot, just some basic practices that can help bring that test weight up. And we buy a lot of oats, for US organic particularly, out of Iowa. So that can show you it is possible to grow high test weight oats in this area. Um, the only thing we do need to work on is our thin counts are still double. So that's just the oats that are thinner, they're not as plump. You can't make a flake with them. And, a lot of, and the flake is what we want to make. We don't want to make more flour. Flour is almost a byproduct of the milling industry. You know, everyone always has too much flour. And a lot of times those thin oats end up going into our screenings anyways. So this is something. So they're still not competing milling efficiency wise just because of those thin oats. But this is huge that we've been able to do that. Okay. So I get a lot of questions like this. Why did we build an oat mill in Iowa? Everybody did. Um, just like we were pointing out, this is where oats used to be grown. If you look, this is all the oat mills in the Midwest. This is an awful graphic. Here's ours, La Crosse Milling, Jenner Mills, Richardson, Quaker Oats. We all built mills here because this used to be where the oats were grown. We also have a mill out in Oregon, which is even more obscure of a place than Iowa. So a lot of U.S. oat mills are in close proximity to you. As we talked about, a lot of the mills don't buy U.S. oats. Um, we are the only one that actively buys conventional oats, but I think that'll change. A lot of them have talked about doing more domestic oats. Sarah kind of touched on it. They spend so much money on research, but they're still not buying your oats. It's not quite making sense. So I do think that'll change but it, it hasn't yet. And even organically, let's look here. So La Crosse, they do organic oats and we do organic oats. These three mills do not do organic oats, okay? They don't mill organically. So we're the only two that mill organic oats in the area and La Crosse buys all theirs from Canada. So why, we've kind of talked about U.S. oats have a 5% mill yield drag. Another big reason is a lot of companies have elevators up in Canada, so they want to keep that money in house. They funnel it through there. And the exchange rate, all those different things that we've talked about make a big difference. We already talked about that. Um, and supply out of the U.S. is variable. It is hard. There were years that we could buy close to 20% of our usage out of the U.S. and other years where we can only buy about five. So it does make a big difference. Okay, how do we get our prices? So there's two different ways. We can use the Chicago Board of Trade like we talked about. This is from Tuesday. I think today it's trading closer to like 234. But what we do is we'll say we're 25 cents over the December board. So you just add 25 cents on, get to 253 a bushel. And then you tell me, I want you to pick it up. And I'm using Albert Lee as an example. That'll cost me 10 cents a bushel, so 243. Pretty simple how we get our prices that way. Another way that we will price it is just a flat price with no basis. So an example is right now for February through May, we're at 275 a bushel delivered. That'd be 265 picked up here. So there's kind of two different ways. We always watch the board to kind of even base our cash price, but there's two different ways if you call that we'll give you a price. We either tell you 25 cents over something or a flat price. 
So Jesse, you said earlier that you, you take 38 pound oaks, but do you take oaks down to 36 and discount them? Yep, good question. 38 pounds is the minimum we like. We will take down to 36, you just get discounted for that. I think on conventional it's uh, a half penny per half pound, so you only get discounted two cents. And organic it'd be double, it'd be four cents then, down to 36. Go ahead. Why does it need to be high? Is it an indicator of a kernel size? Yeah, it's an indicator a lot of times of the plump, the test weight. Um, that's how we know we can make a flake. Another thing is, we're a milling company. We make our money by milling grain. Milling works by volume, not by weight. So you want to have something as heavy as you can, going through volume-wise, to get our best efficiencies. If we run 32-pound oats through our mill, it costs us a lot of money to do that. So we have to keep it, and we have to have a consistent product running through. So that's why the test weight is such a big deal to us. Go ahead. Is that pricing based off a 32 pound bushel or a 30? Yes, good question. And I think I actually explained that maybe on the next slide. Let me just go to the next. Okay, do I get a premium for higher test weight? Because the grade, the USDA grade is 32, but I'm asking for a 38. You do. You get paid off of a 32 pound bushel weight. So if you deliver a 40 pound oat, for every four bushels, you're getting an extra bushel paid for. That makes sense because 40 minus 32 is eight times four. So for every four bushels that goes through, you're getting paid for an extra bushel. So sending us higher test weight oats also benefits you, the farmer, because you get paid off of a 32 pound bushel. Is that clear? Did I? to everyone how that works with it. Okay, I'll go back here. So here are some other prices for barley. We're at $3.95 delivered right now. Rye, we're at $5.25 and wheat's at $5.25. And we buy both winter and spring wheat, either one. So Jesse, how much rye, how much conventional rye do you buy for milling? It can't be a very large. It's not a lot. It's only about 40,000 bushels a year right now. So the main thing we mill is oats, then organic oats, then barley. Barley is our thir third biggest crop we buy. We're always buying barley. Rye, wheat, triticale. I can get full on those pretty quick. So you need to call ahead for those. And that's something to look at like with these small grains and selling direct to like a food company the price is important, but the shipment period is important too, okay? So if you call September 15th and you say you need your oats out next week, there's a chance, and 5% of the time I can move them for you, but a lot of times you have to think ahead a little bit. And that is the bad thing, and it takes sometimes guys to get adjusted to. They're used to the elevator where they can deliver at any time. It, we can get full with it, and part of it's trucks, part of it's storage. We have more storage now, so hopefully that won't be as big of an issue, but do think ahead with that. Shipment period is just as important as the price. Um, these, we usually only buy about three months at a time. Since we don't do as much oats, we will buy out quite a bit lo um, longer. For a price for organics, how do we get our prices? It's all cash price. It's all supply and demand. It's us working with our customers on what price works for them, what price works for the farmer, what are the other organic grains trading at. It's just a constant balance of supply and demand. The test weight for uh, barley and rye. The test weight for barley that we use is 48. We will take to 46. Rye, the minimum is 56. And then wheat, the minimum is 58. We kind of talked about like, you know, you can grow any of these small grains here. If I'm talking to a farmer, like Minnesota, Iowa, first time he's gonna put a small grain in his rotation, I typically do recommend oats, and you think, well, of course you do, that's what you wanna buy. But um, it's also because it just naturally does better in this environment, just by design. When you have a kernel like this that's so closed and tight, that is a perfect environment for vomitoxin to grow. 
Food industry, we do not want vomitoxin. We're very particular about that. So a lot of times I can't buy these grains in this area because they're too high in vomitoxin. So I usually, if you're starting out with small grains, we usually say, oh, it's because you have a better chance of hitting that milling market than you will with these. It doesn't mean you won't. I've bought more wheat and barley this year out of Iowa than I ever have. But usually, I can't buy much. So, any other questions? Well, the question was the minimum quantity. We like to buy a full truckload. Um, if you deliver it yourself, that's fine. But we will work with you on what we call dead freight. So you'll just get a lesser price to cover the extra trucking with it. With organic, sometimes you just can't find it. You're trucking in stuff with only 200 bushels on a truck because you just need it. So conventional work, a little bit more picky with that just because it's not as such a supply problem. Go ahead. Are you able to address the justification of small green crops in Canada from like the state and how it impacts your buying and how it impacts quality of grain? Yeah, I, I talked a little bit about it before. We don't buy any grain in Canada or the U.S. that's been desiccated with glyphosate. Conventionally and obviously organically, it's not. None at all anymore. The reason is because when it comes through the mill, that kernel just shatters because it's like an early frost. And I'll be honest, another reason is, is our customers are concerned about it. When they found out that you could spray glyphosate on something when it's right before it's to be harvested, they freaked out. I mean, that's literally what they did. They freaked out. So that is a market demand and it's a milling functionality problem too. We're not saying that we think, I mean, we all know in this room glyphosate's probably one of the safest chemicals there is out there. It doesn't matter. The customer doesn't want it, so you do what the customer asks with it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other? And then these are just price indications on organic grains right now. Organic oats are around six. Organic barley would be 950, rye 950, and hard red wheat would be at 14. Just to kind of get price indications with that. Okay, so we talked through test weight. Is there a premium since it goes to food? We can typically give about 10 to 25 cents a bushel. This is conventionally over your local markets, except at harvest time, call your local elevators, seed dealers. They will usually be paying more than I am right around harvest time. So you can get a little bit better price, but they fill up fast. So that's on oats. I don't know about the other small grains as much. So, and Sarah kind of talked about that. Really work your local markets. There have been years guys get $4 a bushel for their oats, and I'm paying $2.75. So really work your local markets because you may be able to find a better outlet and just know that we're kind of like a backup with it. The problem is, is there's not a huge feed demand for oats. And that's what we really work on with PFI is because if you don't make that 36 pound test weight, what do you do with your oats then? You may be able to plant them for cover crop on your farm. You may, if you have livestock, you can feed them there, but not everybody has livestock. So that is a problem in the oat market domestically, is if you don't make that milling grade, what do you do? And that's what we're working on a lot with PFI, Albert Lee Seedhouse too, is how do we find a feed demand for oats in the US? Um, feed oat price is very low with corn prices, so here's an example with organic. We're at $6 for food, $3.75 for feed. And conventional feed price is usually 75 cents a bushel lower, if we even have a bid. A lot of times we don't even have a bid on feed oats. So, how do the contracts work? We offer act of God. Um, that includes quality, so if you don't make test weight and there's no way for you to get that test weight up, act of God covers that. We can do full production. We only do full production contracts on organic oats. The rest we do flat bushel amounts. We talked a little bit, need minimum to fill a truck. This is the bushel amounts that fill a truck for all these different grains, typically. 
So we kind of talked a little bit about why people want to buy Canadian oats. So that just to kind of review, this is what you guys have an advantage on with growing oats in the marketplace. Less barley grown here. So gluten-free. Gluten-free is huge. They're finding that the hardest thing to get oats to gluten-free, even though it naturally is, is barley. Because it makes sense. Barley and oat test weights are the closest. Barley's 48. Oats typically come in at 38. It's the two hardest grains to separate. So the fact that there isn't a lot of barley grown here makes them more attractive to a lot of buyers, that they won't have gluten contamination. Glyphosate desiccation, it's not used as much here in the U.S. Local, it's easier to keep the identity preservation. Even though we buy all of our oats from farmers, even up in Canada, when it all gets mixed in a rail car, it just starts to get harder to keep identity preservation rather than when we bring it in by the truckload. And our leadership wants to buy closer to home, too. That's a big push. Okay, and these are some just contacts for the different grains if you are wanting to sell anything of who to call with it. Go, I'll put that in back. Go ahead. What is the moisture bracket? For oats, 10 to 13 and a half percent is the moisture. And we have spec sheets with us here if you want to look at them too. Go ahead. You mentioned earlier that in five years that you don't feel the Board of Trade will trade oats. Uh, the Board of Trade is the, the discovery mechanism for the price of, of any commodity, and then your basis is the difference between the Chicago and Cedar Rapids and Chicago and St. Anne's group, and it keeps everybody on the level. So if you think that the, or that the possibility is there that the, the Board of Trade is going to trade them, what kind of a even pricing mechanism is there going to be throughout the whole industry to, uh, to buy those? Just the same that they use for barley or rye or triticale or organic. It's just calling around, seeing what that person's paying, making sure we're all in line, that nothing's out of line. And you're making sure that someone else isn't buying a dollar over what I am. I mean, I understand what you're saying. The Board of Trade is there, so we have transparency in the market. It's just when you're paying a dollar over on basis, transparency isn't really it's not there anymore. And when there's only really six big buyers of oats in the US, it's also they're only the only ones that are really using the market for what it was intended for. It just really makes it not functional anymore. Uh, do they, will, the, if you call Quaker Oats and Super Rapids, will they be honest with you and say that they're not you know, be Oh, you never know. Right. I mean, and a lot of times for them, I mean, you never know how. They can tell you what they want to say, but I mean, you as the farmer, they should probably be telling you the truth yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. And you find out pretty quick. I mean, and I understand this more since I bought organic grain. You find out pretty quick if you're not right with the market. If all of a sudden your phone is lit lighting up and everyone wants to sell you organic wheat, you know your price is too high. If no one's calling you back, your price is too low. Or you know you just gotta wait. I mean, it's pretty easy to figure out like it's too high right now or there's too many acres going in the ground, we're gonna have too much. So, did you have something, Mac, you wanted to say? Well, I just wanted to say, because I think you touched on it earlier, because the volume of trade on oats on the CDOT is so small, it's very easy to manipulate it. And yeah. Jesse touched on that earlier with the, the, short, the short sellers on all the market. Yeah. Just curious. No, I, I mean, I grew up in the cattle market. My dad bought and sold cattle and bought and sold corn because I grew up on a cattle feed lot. So I grew up with the Board of Trade was, that was it. Like, it was so important. So it's so different being in these cash markets. I mean, there is a lot more room for air and sometimes dishonesty, it feels like. But I mean, and that's where it's important to work with people you know you can trust too with it. But it, it can work because I mean, if we're pricing everything flat um, priced anyways, we're kind of going away from it already, so. Uh, in your experience, uh, what percentage of barley contracts get rejected because of volatile? 
So what percent of barley contracts get rejected because of vomitoxin? I typically don't do new crop contracts in this area because of that. 90% would get rejected because of vomitoxin. Now, if you're a conventional grower, you have options to help with that. And even organically, they have different, I don't know how legit they are that say they can help with the vomitoxin, but I mean, it is something to watch. If you get a humid summer, and it's just gonna be a tough year for your barley with it. Yes. So the question is about like samples. So especially if I do a picked up on your farm contract, I have you send a sample in before we send the truck there. So we can get an idea of what it looks like. The alternative is feed green. Uh, and usually Wisconsin will buy that. Yeah, so the comment was the alternative is feed grade for vomitoxin. You have to be careful even a lot of times they don't want over five parts per million. I mean, and I'll see samples at 12, you know, sometimes. So you really gotta watch that. I'm not trying to say you can't grow barley or rye or wheat. Like you can't, I just be aware that a lot of people struggle hitting that milling grade spec with it. Does that apply to the mulching? Yeah, if you have vomitoxin, you cannot sell into the malting. They're even stricter on it than we are. So for barley, malting has the highest standard than milling. We buy rejected malt all the time because we are not as picky as the malting industry. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, one over there. Okay. I guess just thinking out loud. Yes. Yes. So the question is, if you don't make spec, can you try to upgrade it, essentially? Can you clean it? We have all kinds of tricks in our bag that we'll walk you through. A lot of times, if you come in and your sample has 33 to 35 pound test weight, we'll tell you, they'll work, load the truck with a grain back, and they'll get in and they'll meet spec. Or you can clean them, run them through a screener. Some guys just run them through an auger a couple times. All you're doing is you're shaving off more of that hull, taking off some of that, so making them heavier. So maybe it's not right, but it works. So, but we'll tell you that. Load it with a grain back, do this. I mean, so if your oats come in, I'd say, and there's even been times I've had guys try 32, and they've been able to upgrade them enough. So if your test weight's low, just don't completely give up on them. There is a way, and there are times you can't upgrade them at all but we'll try to tell you different tricks to do with it. And keep in mind too, when you harvest your oats and you take a sample right after you harvest, that's gonna be the lowest test weight they have. When you put them in the bin and oats go through a sweat period where they get really hot and they kinda of go through their final cure, they're gonna gain a couple points in test weight too. So when you test them right out of the field and they're at 34, they're probably gonna be fine. So just kind of some different things to look at. Oats is just a little bit different than some of the other grains that way. Any other questions? Do you take hullless oats? We, the question was, do we take hullless oats? No, we don't. A um, couple reasons. We have a lot of dehullers in our, our process. Um, second, the biggest thing is um, hullless oats. Well, they're more disease prone too for the farmer, that hull is there by design. And then um, when you make them into oatmeal, they don't absorb water. So they don't have that uh, water absorbing capability, so we can't use them. Our customer, we've tried actually to do runs of hullless oats, but the customers can't make it work because they won't absorb water, which is very important in making oatmeal, so.